Hello, everybody. So to, today we're looking at the chapter 17 of the Mastering Shiny book. So um, I'm going to go through the chapter. The chapter basically is all about um, focusing on the software engineering skills that is needed when writing Shiny applications. So he stated, um, give some, that's the code organization skills, testing, dependencies, dependencies management, source code, control, continuous integration, and then finally the code reviews. So um, he also mentioned, hardly mentioned in the book that, okay, software engineering skills is something that you have to continuously improve on. It's a lifelong um, journey. We all have to continue to look at how to upskill and get better at it. We have to learn a lot. So he gives some scenarios where you transition or you're moving, evolving between different stages where you're learning new skills, new techniques. So like, I don't understand it and have to look it up every time, looking at documentations every time. So we all still do it. We have to continue to learn and um, the stages we eventually get to, I understand it and I can use it fluidly. So until we get to this stage, even after getting to this stage, we still have to continuously improve ourselves because things are changing, shiny package as well is changing every time. And the development aspect as well is changing. So these are all the examples he stated here. So he's, re he's recommending setting aside time each week to continuously practice these skills. And um, as we go along, we'll get better with it. So then we're looking at the first thing, the skills, the first skills that we have to imbibe as um, shiny developers is that um, we need to look at our code organization. So he gave an instance, the quote by Martin Fowler. So any fool can write code that a computer can understand, but um, good programmers write code that humans can understand. So basically what he's trying to say that is that we need to look at improving our skills um, in organizing the code. So one of the most obvious ways to improve the quality of an application is to improve the readability and understandability of its code. So we have to look at how we can get better with our code organization. And um, he also mentioned that, okay, being a good programmer means developing empathy for others. So when you're looking at your code, you, it might be understanding to you, even at the first instance. So maybe weeks later, you too might get lost because you might have forgotten what you've written or what you were trying to achieve in your code. So in this instance, it's better for you to have even empathy on yourself. So in case you're coming back to this app or project next time, you can understand it because humans are always humans. You as a person, you're also human. So you might get lost. So then um, the empathy goes a long way with all of us. So he gave some general guidelines, so which includes um, things like are the variables and function names clear and concise? So there are so many guidelines that we have all come across in this instance. Maybe you can share. We, there's different ways that we have to name our functions and variables, some camel case, some snake-like, and that's the using the underscore. There are different ways. So every even every organization has their own ways of naming variables and functions, which you just have to get used to. Because this will conform to you working with others and you will be able to get along well. So another one is do I have comments where needed to explain complex bits of code? It's advisable to always have comments in your code so that when other people are reviewing or looking at your code or even 
copying your code, they would understand what you're trying to achieve at every le le line within your code or even modules. We will talk about this later. So that is just what it's trying to say here. Then does this whole function fit on my screen or could it be printed on a single piece of paper? If not, is there a way to break it up into smaller pieces? So here, when your code is, what it's trying to emphasize here is that when the code is getting too long, kind of going beyond what you can really see on the screen, might want to look at breaking it up. Breaking it up in different ways. We'll talk about functions, models later. So these are the ways that you can make it much more um, easier to use or even for your own good. So am I copying and pasting the same block of code many times throughout my app? If so, is there a way to use a function or a variable to avoid the repetition? So the same thing goes for what we just talked about now that, okay, you might want to make your app readable or even a little bit compact by breaking them down into things like functions, variables, as you might wish. So are all the parts of my application tangled together or can I manage the different components of my application in isolation? So this is a, a big one. So it's talking about the functions that we're coming back to now. So you have to look for a way that you're not just more, more kind of mixing up stuff anyhow or everything is just tangled together that you don't even know which one is going into which and how do I kind of narrow down this one? Where do I place what? This is kind of a mix up hell that one has to really break down to make it easier. So there's, so I don't know if you have any examples or maybe you want to share your experience with all this, but um. There's good news. There's no silver bullet to address all these points. And many times they involve subjective judgment calls. But there are two particular important tools, so which are the functions and the shiny models. So um, these are going to be much better tackled in chapter 18 and 19. So, but basically to sum it up, what function is all about. It allows you to reduce duplication in your UI code, make your server functions easier to understand and test, and allow you to more flexibly organize your app. So it's like a solution, one of the solutions to all these issues here. So then shiny models as well. So it makes it easy to write isolated reusable codes. So this is what's they were looking at here, okay? So your code, you can break your app, the codes inside your app into isolated reusable codes that coordinate the front end and back end behavior. So modules allow you to gracefully separate concerns so that, for example, individual pages in your application can operate independently or repeated components no longer need to be copied and pasted. So there's more to shiny modules and functions, and these are going to be tackled in chapters 18 and 19. So at this point, I don't know if you have any experience you want to share based on code organization and some of the guidelines that we have here. Do you want to share any experience? Um, yeah, I, I'd like to say that it definitely really helps uh, putting everything in different modules. And uh, sometimes you have to use uh, the same module several times. So for example, in one app that I'm working on these days, it requires uh, multiple surveys uh, from the user and it could be different number of surveys for each user. So uh, mm -hmm. I use basically LApply or the per map function uh, to provide a shiny module depending on how many uh, surveys are allocated to that user. And then I use a okay. single module function 
that basically repeats the same questions uh, depending on what day they are completing the survey on. So this way, shiny modules really help. I don't have to repeat the code for the modules. Wow, that's interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um... Yeah, and um, yeah, I have something to say. I could say <clears throat> I have been using uh, functions and modules for a while now. And so in terms of functions, and um, they are just uh, small units of code that uh, should should be like documented. There is documentation, uh, should be document documentation for every function, like doc string or something. And that's why when we use uh, li Python libraries, we have uh, an inspector that show us the, um, uh, the docs or the written docs inside the code of, uh, of an, the open source code. So if we, uh, we're gonna make it like a good application, we will make like, um, a documented function, but that's, I don't see that really as a best practice, uh, um, like been applied, but it's a best practice for sure, uh, to have like this kind of um, um, uh, a documentation side your code for every functions. And you could then uh, separate functions uh, in files like helper functions that you could use uh, in term of course if uh, if you are using like some kind of uh, object orientation you could uh, have function inside the object uh, the class itself and uh, every class has its own functionality and uh, you could use it everywhere you just create an object just one time um, and use use this functionality everywhere for every um, every sub module or module uh, So yeah, um, modules. Uh, so it's uh, that's it. Thank you so much for that contribution. Okay, Derek, you want to share your experience? I have not worked with Shiny much recently, but I too am looking forward to Shiny modules and see if it could help clean up the workflow and such. Okay, that's good. Now, I've had um, a little bit of experience with this as well, and I think it's a lot easier when you break down your apps into models. Just it's, it's a bit much more easier even for testing, for testing and knowing which, like a component base. That's just what I see there, but it's a lot good when we're using these two aspects with the shiny models. I'm still getting my hands around the models as well, because there are so many packaging, different ways of using the models that different um, people that are of much experience than one. There are a lot of ways to create the models and different packages as well. So um, I think it's a lot, there's still a lot to learn about these two as well. So um, thank you for sharing your experiences, thanks. So I will go to the next thing that is the testing now. So um, for your app, you still have to look at developing a test plan for an application. So this is all about developing this test plan. How do you want to check all the functionalities in your app or which what is where and so, Getting to understand your app and show being sure that okay everything is working perfectly well, so this is very very critical to ensure the stability of your app. So he gave the um example here that okay without a test plan every change jeopardizes the application. So that is very very important that you have to really take cognizance of that okay. I can't just be creating apps and having all the features in there. How do I check or be certain that my app is stable and then I can really see that all the functionalities there are working as it should work. So it's a lot of work, <laughs> even I think it's more work when we're looking at, okay, it's so easy to put all the features there in your app. But now looking at testing each company, how do they work with each other? 
that is another big work. So he started with um, creating basic testing plan, like creating a manual. So, but there is always disadvantages, advantages and disadvantages to every, <laughs> every maybe techniques that we're using. So for this, it's by getting it to a state that, okay, it's more complex to manage and might be even more boring to write. So automating it or even creating a test plan other than just writing this manual process of checking all components might be better. So, um, okay, so it leads to a lot of things that, okay, when it gets more complex, you either spend more, more and more of your time manually testing the application or you start skipping some of the scripts, yeah. So the next step is to start to automate. So automating of your app is much more easier, but it's a lot more difficult to start. But when you get to get some things running, it's much more better. So automation takes time. So to set up, just like you said here, but it pays off over time. So because you can run the test more frequently, it's just like clicking a button and things are going on well. So that is the reason why we have to do this. But for the manual process, you just have to get somebody to sit down and be writing this and you still have to put that person through. It's a lot of time there. So then, so the automation is going to be talked about better in chapter 21. So then the chapter will explain all this. So the unit tests that confirm the correct behavior of an individual function integration tests to confirm the interaction between reactives, functional tests to validate the end-to-end -end experience from a browser, then load tests to ensure that the application can withstand and the amount of traffic you anticipate for it. So they, these are the things that you'll get to learn more about in chapter 21. So the beauty of writing an automated test is that once you've taken the time to write it, you will never need to manually test that portion of the application again. And this is something that we'll still get to see more of it in this continuous integration and development. So if you have the automated test configured and written properly, you can always like, it can go on by itself without you even interfering with it anymore. So it's it's easy, but to start with, it's not so easy. So do we want to share anything on this testing aspect? The testing part? I know there is still a lot to be discussed in chapter 21, but I think if you have any contribution here. I just have a question if someone knows. Um... Okay. I tried to write unit tests for uh, connecting with a database, which is remote. Uh, so, for example, a database in the cloud where you send the API requests. Uh, the general advice I get is that that's probably better not to write tests, unit tests for that because uh, it's outside of R because you're sending a request and then receiving uh, data from the HTTP request. So does anyone have any experience writing any tests for that kind of uh, behavior? Actually, no. For the database aspect, uh -uh, no. So, but using some basic um, packages like the test that I need test. And so I, I don't know if it's extend to the database aspect um, I'm not really sure of that. So maybe someone can help us, Ahmed, Derek. Um, so I want, yeah, I want to, uh, I want to ask Amir, um, what kind of HTTP request are you, are you, are you using? Do, do you as just give a get request and get, like get, get some detail or something like that? Yeah, so for example, in a get request, you may get the data back or it may fail in multiple different ways. Maybe the server is not responding or you made a mistake while making a request. 
So for a few of these, I can write tests, uh, but there could be many other conditions. Okay, but the, you you could do this, I think, with, uh, yeah, I could. Uh, what I'm thinking of is uh, like uh, exception handling. So you could do this kind of exception handling mm -hmm. for, for the response that you get from the uh, from the request. Um, testing part, I think they, we have like, uh, like something called like um, uh, I don't I don't I don't remember its its, it's exact name, but what it do is checking if the database is up or not, and based on it, um, you get the uh, uh, you get a flag or yes or no or something like that. But uh, to simulate that, you could do this in the uh, in testing to test the if, if the uh, it, it's the same as uh, like exception handling when you have a status code. So the HTTP request was, will have a response with a status code. If the right. response, if the status code is uh, is two hundred, then it's successful. If right. if it's four hundred and four, then it's not found. If five hundred is there's a server issue. So uh, there is a specific like mapping between the status code and the status of the um, uh, of the server itself. So you could use that to dis decide it being a data application um, or a command to uh, write or uh, get data from the database is to see if the server is up or not uh, with this kind of functionality. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll think about it more. Thank you. Um, so yeah, this is in, uh, um, in the internet, what it, it resembles and what are the symbols under the numbers and uh, what it could be to do with it. And um, this has been designed in, 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 and integrated in every uh, web, app, web uh, framework application, uh, web framework like uh, Django and Flask. So they already built for this kind of functionality. And of course, Fast ABI is doing this as well uh, in, uh, in Python. But uh, it's the same. I think there is a, the same any any type of HTTP request. When you get a response, you will have to have like a status code. So you could depend your uh, logic on the status code. Yeah. Yeah. Generally, I handle that when I'm using the function inside the app. So I like put it in a try catch statement or use an if statement, and that works. Uh, but writing the test was challenging. So, but yeah, we can discuss more about that in the testing chapter. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think that's sorted out there. Thank you, Ahmed and Mayor. Okay, so we'll go to the next um, part of the chapter that is dependency management. So um, there's a lot about this. So if Okay, we're talking about reproducibility and also managing the like your packages here. So in Shiny, what we do with ordinary um, analysis here um, is not always applicable with the Shiny app. So, but an app dependency are uh, anything beyond the source code that it requires to run. So these could include files, dry, hard drive, files on the hard drive or an external database, just like the question that we may have raised now, or API or other R packages that use the app. So we're going beyond just package dependencies or something. So that is what we're looking at here when we're talking about dependency management in Shiny app. So for so it gave an example. Actually, I, I would even love to, there's a, a, an, an interesting um, discussion on LinkedIn today. Uh, it was a new package, Nix, for managing dependencies as well. So a lot, a lot came up there that, okay, Nix um, versus Renv that we have here. And um, Docker as well. So it's it's a lot of it's an interesting discussion there on online today. So but there's this is just an example, Rem. 
So Laura saying that, okay, this is just for packages, but using it in shiny apps and might be kind of a controversy. So, but Rev on its own enables you to create reproducible R environments. So using REM, you can capture the exact package versions, especially that's the versions that you were talking about, that your application uses so that when you go to use this application, another computer, you can use exactly the same package versions. So this is um, very important, especially when you're looking at production deployment and that is very important. The another way you can look at it when you're looking beyond just packages is using the config package. So the config package doesn't actually manage dependencies itself, but it does provide a convenient place for you to track and manage dependencies other than our packages. That is very important. It tracks and manage dependencies other than our packages. So example could be CSVs or even databases. So you might want to subset your CSVs and um, create some URLs here, manage the URL for the API and so on and so forth. So it gave some scenarios here where this would be useful. So having this enumerated in the config file gives you a single place where you can track and manage these dependencies. So even better, it enables you to create different configuration for different environments. So if you're looking at your testing environment or de development environment, you create a different config for that, okay? Configurations for that. Then you are looking at the production, you create a different one for that one as well. So a very interesting example is um, when you're looking at analyzing data from a database. So you might not want to be developing and con testing directly to the actual database that is going to go into production. But I want to create a, a, a kind of a simplified version of that database and create a configuration for that and another configuration for the production um, environment. So, um, so this is what he's trying, he tried to explain here. So the same thing goes for the CSV. So lastly, be wary of making assumptions about local files. So be very, very careful about this. So if your code has reference to things like this, um, might be an issue when you're moving it from one computer to another. So there are different packages, different like the hair package and so on and so forth. You can maybe include that in your app. So but if there are other maybe contributions from you guys, you can add from your experience, how do you manage dependencies? Um, what do you use? <laughs> are you using REM or you're using config package? Which one? Or you dockerize or you using Docker and all this? I don't know. So, but let's share the experience. It was really an interesting discussion here because a lot of packages are out there for doing all this a lot they're kind of are we doing the same thing over and over again so share your let's share your experience let's hear your experiences i have used rn uh, for uh, managing the package dependencies for other projects but not for a shiny app uh, i generally use the golem framework that uses uh, okay, okay. Uh, it has a function that will generate uh, an rn file for you a log file that will contain all the dependencies so that is really useful and um, the config package is also used by the golem framework so it creates a app underscore config dot r file uh, and that contains a function uh, actually two functions where you can uh, so in one function you can add any any type of dependency as mentioned here, like uh, connections to production and development databases uh, and you put conditions how you connect to them. Uh, but it also has a function for the paths to different files. 
So you may have some files in your data folder, some files in your www folder that contains uh, like images that you want to add in the app. So the config package helps in connecting to uh, those different paths uh, and uh, also uh, with other managing other types of dependencies. So Golem framework is very helpful and automatically uses config package for that. But I haven't really had the chance to uh, do this for my app where they have uh, different options for production and development databases. The way I was handling it was uh, two different uh, GitHub uh, repo uh, branches. So one branch for development, one branch for production. But this could also be useful where you connect to a database using uh, just a single file mm -hmm. config or using the config package. So it's interesting to okay. look into more. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. And I also I'm actually not that, so uh, familiar with Golem. No. Yeah, Golem also has a an accompanying book now, uh, for I think for a year or two now. Um, it's engineering production grade. Uh, it has a book. Yeah, it uh, the author who, okay. who wrote the package also wrote uh, a book. So it also. Okay. Teaches... Would you like to share the link? I don't know. Yeah, I'll share. Mm -hmm. Okay. And while I'm doing that, also, um, I saw the discussion on the Nix, uh, the Rix package, which is based on the Nix uh, package manager. So the advantage of using Nix is that you can not only specify uh, all the packages uh, that you're using for your app, but you can also specify the version of the R. So it the Rix package will generate uh, the uh, file that uh, tells the Nix package manager what to install. So in that file, you can specify that I want, for example, R version 4.3.2 and uh, all the other dependencies. So it could include other software like Python as well. So anything that you want to install for your app or any other project, you can do that with the uh, Nix package manager. And it's outside of uh, R, uh, it's an independent project, but the Rix package is an R package that would generate that file for you. Okay, that is interesting. Thank you. I'll definitely take time to check it out. So, Ahmed, um, Derek. Where uh, are no. you there? Ahmed, Derek? Okay. 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 Okay, thanks. Okay, I've seen the link. Thank you. Um, okay. Oh, no, come back. Okay, so we'll go to, okay, we're done with dependencies now. So I'll quickly go over the source code management. And I think that's something that all developers or programmers would have to get used to, at least learn something to manage um, a, a framework to manage your codes. So we, there's a lot to so the source code management and the continuous integrate kind of intertwined. So the most popular versions control system for the R communities, Git. So, so I don't know if there's. I'm using Git as well. So I don't know if there's any other one. So, but they all have different framework and platform where you can use Git. Um, just I mentioned here now. So I believe most of us are using Git as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, good. So for the continuous integration or development, deployment now, CICD. So um, once we are good with our version control system and have a robust automated test, you might benefit from this continuous integration. The CI is a way of perpetually um, validating, okay, that the changes you're making to your application haven't broken. 
anything in any way. So this is good where especially you can use it to retroactively to notify you if things go wrong, especially when you're using things like GitHub Actions. So I'm used to GitHub Action. I have not used Travis CI or Azure Pipelines before. So I'm just here. So then I tried GitLab, but I'm still trying to get used to it. But I prefer this too. So, so if you have any other contrary opinion here. So, but streamlining your workflow is something that we all need to add into our portfolio as shiny developers for the CI CD. So that's for that. And um, so the code review, the code reviews now. So here, this is done a lot in organizations, especially when you have, you're working as a team and you have some, like somebody like a team leader or somebody who has to ensure that everything is okay the way it should be. So that is, um, what we're looking at when we're talking about code review. It has a lot of benefits here. So it helps catch bugs before they get in, incorporated into the application, making them much more or less expensive to fix. So um, offers teaching opportunities both for the reviewer and the person that is being reviewed. So it facilitates cross-pollination and knowledge sharing across a team to eliminate having only one person who understands the app. So this helps everybody to be on the same page that, okay, we all understand this. So rotation of the reviews makes it achievable this way. So the resulting conversation often improves the readability of the code. So if you're having some kind of controversial sections in your app or code, functions or models, talking about it, chatting about it, or discussing this formally or informally would help kind of improve the, yeah, okay, thanks. Improve that better. So um, thank you, Derek, for sharing that. There's a link in the chat that um, kind of relate to what we're talking about here. Okay, so so this is these are the things that we do with the um, review. Then, so it involves someone other than you, but you can still benefit from it. So if you're working solo, working alone, going over or going through what you've done so far before it gets a little bit too complicated would really help you perfect your application. So. These are a few questions that you might have in your head when you're reviewing your codes. So do new functions have concise but evocative names? So are there parts of the code you find confusing? What are areas are likely to change in the future and would particularly benefit from automated testing? So does the style of the code match the rest of the app? So is everything in conformity with what you should be doing or what is expected of you? So, um, so or even better, you your group's documented code star. So is that exactly, so you have to look at, am I doing it the way is expected or not? So especially when you're working with a team or in an organization, or you are even consulting for an organization, they would have some maybe rules or documented code star that you have to follow. So reviewing this would help you deliver well on your project. So um, if you're embedded in an organization with strong engineering culture, setting up code reviews for data science code should be relatively st straightforward. So if you're in an organization like that, then good. You're in a good place where things will be easy. So, um, so you recommended two sources here that you can check out. So this is the end of the chapter 17. So some really, um, we've learned a little bit of software engineering mindset that we should 
kind of in Bible, learn more. So the next chapter will deal with the function writing and so on and so forth. So do you have questions, comments, addition to this? Yeah, I have uh, like a little bit about uh, good reviews. So, okay. Uh, so good re good reviews are like in my last organization, I was doing some good reviews for some uh, other colleagues, and I have been good uh, good reviewed by other persons. And it really like what it said here is it's a teaching opportunity, uh, and it's um, a learning opportunity as well. So uh, you teach others um, what could they miss in the in the in the in their code, and you could as well learn from others uh, um, when you've been code reviewed by, by yourself. And it's a mindset before it's it, it it it's a technical thing. It's a mindset of before you review. Uh, um, like get a, a, a code review you should do what's called like self-review so as it's stated here you could review yourself you review your code uh, before you uh, push it to production and for people that doesn't uh, feel that if they work alone or a, as a consultant or something uh, to get the flavor of that you could contribute to an open source so in if you contribute it to an open source you will get reviewed and the pull request will um, will get re actually uh, reviewed by uh, one of the maintainer of the project and you'll get tips, you'll get um, uh, a learning uh, opportunity and as well as contributing to the open source or open, co open source community. And that's really will uh, hike up your, uh, your profile or your portfolio uh, as well. So, um, I highly recommend contributing to open source. Uh, like just pick a project that you really like and use every day, um, and uh, see if there is a problem or uh, issues in on that project, and try to have a discussion with the maintainers. Uh, begin with a issue, with a, with a small issue that uh, they they have like a tags in open source. Uh, like first good first issue and other stuff for beginners that they uh, which, which beginning to uh, to contributing in, in to open source uh, begin with that and uh, evolve to uh, like I think I see some people that getting jobs from this like from contribution to the open source so for example if you are contributed to shiny you will highly will be like a prob probability of you getting higher uh, doing the shiny work will be uh, like like 50, 95 percent uh, because you already invested in the framework itself and you you know its core component and stuff that build uh, behind the scene so you know how your way with the module itself or the uh, or the library itself so uh, yeah I, I just recommend very uh, very recommending uh, uh, contributing to open source it's a learning opportunity and you will try the could the could review yourself and you'll get um a lot of information like in a very short, short period of time awesome thank you so much for that contribution so do we have any other contributions think Okay, I think that's all from my side here. Thank you. Yes, yeah, true. Thank you so for presenting us in, a, uh, in this session. Um, we actually like getting more into the mindset of software engineering right now. So um, I hope you guys will benefit from the other chapter as well because we are evolving in the in terms of uh, just knowing the shiny itself now into the mindset of creating a good shiny app and how you could like organize our code uh, doing testing and um, using the best practices as well uh, and that will be uh, that's the core of being um, 
um a uh, like a professional shiny developer not just uh um a data scientist that have like um a small knowledge about uh cool best practices and they try to just uh build, building up stuff without uh really having this best practices built in and that's what will distinguish us in uh, uh in the market like uh, and give a boost a boost your to your portfolio as well so it's very important uh this chapter will give us give us the the needed knowledge for uh for us to evolve so thanks for Kiso for uh, presenting uh, today and uh see you later thank guys you. Thanks. okay thank you thank you bye bye thank you bye